Just to give you uh, a quick background why these two architects are here, it's part of our series of duels and duets. Um, but this one, it has a particular context in the sense of um, it's probably one of the few that we have that it has the capacity to have one-to-one -one comparisons in terms of the material. There's a certain similarity, which in many of these cities hasn't been the case. Um, Elia Bronze and Mira Henry, uh, which are the two architects that will be entertaining us tonight, um, both of them did two exhibitions that was part of uh, an agreement that we did with UMA, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and the director there, Joe Rosa, who has been a long, long supporter of architecture and, and always new ideas and supporting young architects to exhibit. So last year, we had the idea, talking with Joe, that it would be interesting to exhibit the work of a young architect from SciArc over there in Michigan. And they will have a young architect from the University of Michigan exhibit on SciArc. So each institution invited three or four young faculty to submit for it. And we chose, uh, oh, I chose the one for the one in SciArc. It was Ellie. And Joe chose Mira to be the one over there. So both of them did uh, not quite parallel exhibition, but similar exhibition with similar size and um, not similar context necessarily. But there was a very interesting dialogue at that level that happens at the work that wasn't displayed. Um, the one here was displayed in our library. And to today is not only about that. They will probably cross paths on many other issues. But that was a little bit the frame of reference. And I think this is an important thing, um, particularly since, in many ways, exhibitions has become in the main platform for young architects to test and explore um, their ideas. Uh, in this case, what, what, I, what I'm interested to see is, I think both of them represent um, very strong positions in relation to very contemporary tendencies that we can see present in our schools another one. I think there is a lot of commonality right now going on between SIAC and Michigan. Uh, like everything else always happens at the human level. So there is a lot of exchange of ideas among colleagues that I think has produced in a very fluid conversation. And this one probably, uh, it will take the shape of something a little bit more formal, but I think this has been going on for a while. And I think is what we, we are here to see. So with not much further ado, um, I would like to invite Ellie and Mira to come to the stage and start. I know it's a little bit unfair for Ellie because I think it's a two to one already. Um, it, it's Mira. Mira is counting for two. So already I think you have an uphill battle, Ellie. Uh, so you're going to have to figure it out how to navigate that. Um, but it's a pleasure to have uh, two incredibly talented young architects here at the school to discuss their ideas. And let's see what they have to say. Please join me to welcome Mira Henry and Eli Abrams to SIAC. Hi, so um, maybe just to give a little background on the structure of how we're gonna run the talk. Uh, Mira is going to uh, show her work and talk for a bit, and then I'm going to do the same. And then uh, at the end, we've selected a series of images that we're going to kind of engage together. Three, three acts. Yeah. We have three acts. Three acts. Yeah. Short, three short acts. OK. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Hernan, um, for the introduction. And thank you for um, putting this opportunity together. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be here um, presenting in front of all my colleagues and friends and students, um, especially thanks to the students who helped me put the show together. And, um, and it's an honor to be here with Ellie. Let's see, can you guys hear me okay? Um, who's uh, a friend and somebody whose work I respect a lot. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna get started. So this is an introduction, an introduction of my work to you. 
The work itself is also an introduction. It is an ushering in of a project in formation. And unlike the first type of introduction, be it of a person or a text, uh, the work itself is not made up of generalities. The content I'll be showing you is in fact concerned with quite the opposite. It's concerned with specificities and details. At the time that I was awarded the UMA Commission, I've been working on a series of projects in the form of drawings and models. I'm showing you um, images of four of these projects uh, today here. Um, these four were submitted in response to the UMA RFQ, or request for qualifications. Um, and one of the projects was a competition entry. The others were pure speculation, um, for which I set all of the terms. So while each project had its own set of contexts and constraints, uh, they were all motivated by an interest I have in thinking through the idea of the elemental in an architectural project, or what I like to call the primitive. Um, I like to use the term the primitive um, because it is a slippery term and has multiple definitions. Um, with it, we have connotations of both innocence and wildness, purity and beastliness, ruled and unruly, uncolored and colored. And while packed with contradiction, the term always points to an idea of a beginning or a fundamental point of departure. Uh, recently within the discipline, certainly among many of our colleagues, there's been a returned interest to the question of where to begin. Be it with a precedent, a gabled roof, a rock, a mountain, or a sphere, where one begins not only produces a diversity of, has, has produced a diversity of aesthetic projects, um, but has also proclaimed a sort of ideological stance, be it for history, plurality, messiness, measurement, whatever. Um, so the four projects you're seeing here began with, um, by assuming a distinct primitive. Um, starting from the left, those were the fireplace, the roof eave, an interior corner of a room, and a table. Uh, the fireplace project was a competition for a pavilion in a, very, in a formal garden in Britain. Uh, the roof eave was a speculative set of houses set somewhere between the jungle and a china cabinet. The room corner, titled Martinique, is an exercise in fakeness. And the table was based on a text which began, the philosopher staring pensively at the table in front of him begins to unsee things and deals with the process of translation and the potential to destabilize the reading of a thing. Um, so I'm overlapping here uh, these, another set of um, primitives, maybe are perhaps more well known. These are Semper's uh, Four Elements of Architecture from the mid 19th century. Um, so for Semper, there was these four, these four points of departure in architecture, four elements and their associated set of materials. Um, the hearth um, in association with ceramics, the roof in association with carpentry, um, the enclosure uh, which um, he, uh, he associated with the textile, and the mound in association with um, masonry or stereotomy. So um, I, can't, I can't claim that I was completely um, conscious of the striking comparison at the time that I was working on these projects. But it does speak to a deliberate effort on my part to set my gaze specifically at, um, to the internal parts or details of a building as a place of investigation. The mound is, um, I would concede, doesn't really fit with my table. But even to Semper, um, this was the least consequential of elements. So if these projects were my treatise, um, then maybe I'm making an argument towards the inclusion of more informal things that rub up against the building, uh, like furniture and tablecloths that are perhaps considered more of the extremities of a dwelling. I titled the installation for UMA, The View Inside, an exhibition of architecture. And much like these earlier projects, the installation grows out of my interest in seeing the internal or conventional parts and materials of architecture as a place to begin within a contemporary context. I used the project Martinique that looked at the problem of rendering the interior corner as a sort of sketch for the installation and extended the project um, into how to render the entire, an entire room at one-to-one -one scale, um, what I call flattening a room. Um, I'm gonna return to the significance of a single room as a subject along with the aesthetics project at stake. Um, I wanna begin, however, with uh, some of the broader contextual forces that began to thread themselves into the concept of the installation. So the show, I would argue, is, is a gentle resistance to my own impulse to import a foreign object into the museum for display. So instead, the exhibition implicates the site of the museum gallery itself and builds content through a close examination of its context. 
So sitting in the middle of the campus quad, UMA is the oldest university museum in the country. It consists of two structures, a 19th century neoclassical building and a new wing completed, um, completed by Allied Works in 2009. Um, and before I um, flying to Michigan to see the site, I had a long conversation, the project kind of began when I had a long conversation with Joseph Rosa, the director of the museum. He um, was is really kind and he spent a long time with me on a, fall, on a phone call going through his expectations of the show. Um, he explained that, explained that because it was a teaching museum, he wanted to show a collection of work, preferably three projects, and one new one. He requested the work I show was two-dimensional, or mostly 2D, because the gallery um, that I was to exhibit in is very narrow. Um, and finally, and this was kind of the most interesting request um, to me, that he stipulated that his, museum installation, that his mu museum installation team do all of the install, and that no major institute construction would be allowed. So this last quest, uh, request is, Kind of, uh, kind of wildly counter to most projects given to young architects, that which assume more of a DIY um, modality. Um, certainly, most installation commissions expected of young architects um, expect that both young architects can both design and build, and that given this kind of slightness of the budget, would need to come with a computer in one hand and a hammer in another. Um, this was not the case for the formal halls of the museum. Um, so the image of the old and new that the museum expresses from the exterior, we also can see extending onto the interior. Um, um, however, this sense of difference is mitigated by the liberal use of high saturation color that coats the walls of each gallery. So there's deep browns and purples for the South Asian and African collections, maroons and inky blues for the medieval, celadon blues for the East Asian, clean whites for the modern and contemporary work, as if in their paint color, the walls begin to anticipate their inhabitants. And by association, the wall color leaps onto the extensive set of highly detailed vitrines um, and pedestals that populate the galleries. Um, so uh, it's, it, this is not a, a typical museum context in the sense, or more of a classical museum context, right? So the museum is not mute, it's not minimal. Um, uh, separate from the art that is actually on display, the background of each room, its walls, and its pedestals can be read as highly active characters in the scene. Um, and as a, an important aside, the structure of the contract for the project, um, along with my artist fee, there is an also an additional installation allocated, fund allocated for the construction of all pedestals, plexi hoods, and art framing. Um, so here is um, the top you see in elevation in the bottom of plan, uh, measured drawing of the gallery that I was to install in. Um, it is what the museum calls um, their bridge, one of their bridge galleries. Uh, it has a wall on one side for the display of art and on the other side a glass guardrail that opens onto a three-story atrium. I began this project with this drawing. Um, it documents all of the existing conditions of the gallery. So on the top in the elevation we see an un uninterrupted wall measuring approximately 52 foot in length and nine foot two in height. At the bottom of the wall, there's a flush baseboard separated by a quarter inch reveal. The wall terminates above at a soffit um, with a reveal where their vertical and horizontal surfaces meet. So there's a sort of, a sort of slight drop shadow that appears at the, um, at the top where, this, uh, where the soffit is. Um, there are two electrical receptacles and one metal corner guard on the right side. Um, in the plan you see, which is below, um, the, there's, it shows 11 foot 8 between the wall and the glass guardrail that looks onto the atrium. So given it is very narrow space, given the narrowness of the gallery um, the clients and the client's desire to keep the ex exhibition rather flat, I pointed my interest to the surface of the wall itself. So for our purposes, let's call the wall surface the site. So as a nod to the context, the characters of my project are the same. Wall surfaces and pedestals. I call this room the reference room. Uh, the room has no doors, no windows, no ceiling, and no ground. It is a room of four perimeter, sur perimeter, sur perimeter surfaces, a series of inset surfaces, uh, five pe pedestals, and a collection of frames. The only requirement I had for the, on, on, from the outset is that the measurements of this reference room as, are calibrated such that when unfolded as a flat construct, it would fit the UMA wall in length and details. This is the photograph of a model of the room. And this is the model of the room once flattened and projected into the museum um, bridge gallery. And this is a photograph of the reference room model from the exterior. Um, it's nearly mute. Uh, the potency um, of the interior 
or the concept of the interior, lies in its ability to withhold information from the outside and to construct a space of autonomy on the interior. So this quality is, the, is one of the reasons that the concept of the interior has been a fixation of mine for some, quite some time. And so in developing this project, I returned to, the, um, to, three, to three particular rooms as precedents. Um, so the three rooms, starting from the left, uh, Schinkel's tent room in Charlottenhof Palace, Loss's room for Lena, um, his wife, um, and Philip Johnson's guest room um, in the brick house. Each of these rooms establishes a nearly hermetic space in which a series of rules and orders are played out internally. Walls, floors, and furniture are all elements that double, overlap, and blend. And in the case of Schinkel, this, work, this works with the play of wallpaper and drapery, for Loos, drapery and carpet, and for Johnson, screens and columns. Um, the reference room that I constructed for Uma lines itself most directly with Loos's room for Lena. Um, on the left is a picture of the room at the time of its design, and on the right is a reproduction um, constructed by Max Center in Vienna last year. Um, I'm, there's, many people are obsessed with this room. It's, it's an incredible um, project. Um, and, and as, as it pertains to this project, I lo was looking at the way that the drapery doubles the line of the, the, line of the wall. Um, so creating kind of an independent internal sleeve that at times follows the path of the perimeter and at other times deviates, swallowing nightstands and bureaus along the way and producing its own figure in the room. So returning to the reference model, you can see a similar game at play um, of um, play out of the perimeter line and an interior line. In this case, the interior surface is break, fold, and overlap. And here's the same image projected on a monitor in the gallery um, at the installation. Um, here's a, another installation photo of the reference room flattened in the bridge gallery. Um, the image or flattened construct um, of the room is, a, is applied as wallpaper, coating the surface of the wall much like a richly colored, the richly colored paint in the other galleries. And the color, which hovers somewhere between mauve and brown, was sampled from one of the galleries. Each pedestal is produced per, per my specifications, thanks to the embedded installation fee that I was able to take advantage of. They were designed to be um, pretty restrained. I didn't want to freak the museum out by over-designing these things. Um, but I did want to take advantage of the fact that they were going to be constructing something for, these, for, this, for this work. Um, uh, so they're kind of conservative, but um, effectively boxes poised on legs. So um, sometimes with mul multiple legs, sometimes the legs are long, um, and all to kind of take on a vaguely domestic quality, um, much like the, the pedestals that were throughout the museum are sort of in the style of uh, kind of a Chippendale style. Um, so the pedestals display the, the other three projects that were required by the client. This is um, uh, showing the table, series of tables, models, and, project, and, and video of that, of that project. This, one, this project is a fireplace project. <clears throat> um, at the edge of the installation, subtle continuities can be read which break, speak to my interest in producing the illusion of fitness to the gallery. So the thin shadow line at the ceiling um, and the reveal of the baseboard of the gallery are reproduced and extended into the rendered image. Um, so I want to speak more directly about the choice of, 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 of drapery and as imagery. Um, so for those of you that know me know that I've been interested in drapery and its formal effects for, for quite some time. Um, there are things about drapery, the capacity to conceal and reveal, to produce effects of movement and materiality, um, all things that I really like. Um, however, in this project I decided to select imagery, um, drapery specifically, uh, which has the capacity to be highly evocative but in response to construct something far more mute and restrained. So in contrast to the room, with Le Le uh, the room for Lena, with its loose, ethereal fabric, um, the drapery in this construct is rigid, repetitive, idealized. Um, so the authenticity of the materiality is replaced by a digital texture map, effectively draining the expected atmospheric effects out of the scene. So instead, drapery is used as a sort of system of order or language. 
It provides a clear idea of top and bottom and edges. And when it comes to certain details, like it, it comes with drapery, comes a certain series of details like rails, rings, standoffs. They have their own set of behaviors and associated dimensions. Um, there are certain things drapery does really well, like hang vertically. Um, other things it does not do well, like fold horizontally. Um, and this way, um, if we wanted to look closely, um, we will notice how things, how these systems play out and where they break down and where they misbehave. Um, so scenic wallpaper, like the panoramic image, are examples of flattened views um, that I spent a lot of time looking at. In this case um, of a French scenic block print from the 19th century, the aim is for fantasy, immersive effects, and seamlessness. In comparison, this scenic image is a bit banal, repetitive, and exhibits what I call um, uh, a series of difficult seams. I want to talk about this, these seams. Um, uh, it's, in these, it's, it's, it's in these regions um, that the illusion of coherence breaks down and disrupt, the disruption of the system becomes legible. Um, layers of shadows begin to stack and fold. Um, drapery rails start to float, they double, they break, um, and there's these cryptic errors signal a system under duress. Also at stake is the construction of an image that explores an increasingly nuanced range of tone within a monochromatic palette. So this is quite different from the French scenic wallpaper, which is most notable for its use of a wide range of colors to build an immersive image. So color theory tactics of the time were employed, um, in the case of French scenic wallpaper, like using contrasting colors against one another to produce depth, vibrancy, and variation. This image is effectively monochromatic. Uh, the same RGB color was selected for the figure of the drapery as well as the wall surface beyond. So while depth and variation of tone are created through the use of light and shadow, there's also a natural flattening or collapse of the elements at play. So this dual actual action of spatializing and then collapsing is a formal game that I, I tend to play out a lot in my work. Um, so as a way of closing, um, the last aspect of the project I want to speak about is the artifact of the drawing set. Um, generally speaking, the drawing set performs a critical role as the central contractual document between the designer and the builder. Um, we can also read it more conceptually as a repository of knowledge and labor. Um, I love this comparison um, from a clog essay, um, which looks at um, a Breuer detail from 1958 and imagines its reproduction in 2013. Um, so on the left is the original drawing, on the right, um, uh, what, what was a kind of set of brief notes indicating design intent is replaced by this sort of litany of directives and specifications. So this paradigm of excess um, points to the contemporary drawing set as an artifact which, much like an archive, deliriously collects and piles information and, refer and references. So the drawing set for this project is a rather slight eight-page document, which focuses first on the representation of the reference room, followed by the projection of the room in the bridge gallery. It includes a pages of uh, general notes, uh, floor plans, lighting plans, reflected ceiling plans, uh, sections, details, elevations, interior elevations. Given the status of the reference room as a site of speculation, the drawings all presume the, a digital environment as the site of the construction, um, unless otherwise noted. So that means, I'm not sure how well, probably can't read. Um, we see that um, at this section detail um, that surfaces have no thickness, all materials are referred to by their bump and image maps, um, colors by their RGB values, lighting and shadows are constructed by um, their emitter location and properties. So the drawing set of a digital model, basically. All references are called out. So in this case, um, uh, the drapery details refer to Losa's precedent. Um, and a presumed set of knowledge is laid out in the general notes as terms and defi um, are defined and processes are specified. 
So returning to this image of the room with no doors and no windows, um, the only way to access this room is through its representation. Like this photograph with, it, with its privileged perspective from above, each artifact of the installation, be it the small models or the large models, the small drawings or the large drawings, all aim to construct a distinct view inside. Thank you. Hi, uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, so thank you to Hernan and to Syrek for inviting me and I'm incredibly honored to be on this, sharing the stage up here with Mira, so. Um, and thanks for the talk, that was great. Uh, so the first half of this talk, um, I'm gonna, gonna kind of give the talk in parts. The first half, uh, which is the RIP portion, is a kind of eulogy of sorts for a body of work that's been uh, in creation for the past few years and includes the gallery exhibition that I had here in the spring, Inside Things, which I largely regard as a resolution of sorts for that work. And the second half, the WIP half, um, is titled as such because I'm also gonna use tonight as a chance to show some very recent work, some of it still in progress. So for the past three or four years, I've been working on projects like this, projects primarily concerned with architectural things and objects, their forms, their materiality, their details, their fabrication, their insides, their accumulations and aggregations. And in particular, I've been interested in an understanding of things as, <clears throat> excuse me, of things as objects that have the ability to affect us, to form us, establish us. And this interest draws uh, from Triple O, or object-oriented ontology, of course, and a rethinking of subject-object relationships, but perhaps more specifically, I've been influenced by Bill Brown's thing theory, where things are what is excessive in objects, what exceeds their materialization or utilization. And in particular, I've been interested in formal languages that are both familiar and elusive, what I call elusive form, best understood uh, as forms that evoke many things but are none of them. So in other words, they're familiar but strange. And they often draw on elemental associations with the body, sexuality, and decay. They aren't representations of something else, but rather it's just what they are. They don't tell a story or produce a metaphor, and they're not scaled representations of other things. Maybe I just said that. Um, so the exhibition here at SciArc was in many ways working with this set of ideas. Um, the exhibition, which was here in the library gallery uh, and opened this past March, was comprised of four sets of objects on podiums and four drawings. And the formal languages evoke familiar things. So in this case, primarily bodies and parts of bodies. You could see belly buttons, teeth, cleavage, fingers, fleshy appendages, and so forth. But the ambition was that they would evoke these associations while remaining open to others. Uh, and the work doesn't rely on estrangement, I would say, because it moves towards not away from known things. So uh, there's an attitude towards abstraction, where abstraction's not in the service of the universal or the infinite, a kind of modernist version of abstraction, but here, uh, searching for multivalence and layered associations. The objects appeared both as models, so uh, maybe scaled representations of larger things, and objects just as you see them. So that confusion was produced uh, by section cuts on the podiums, which you see an example of on the image on the left, uh, which reveal um, the in kind of interiors of these aggregations and the landscapes on which the forms sit. And then the presentation on podiums in the gallery, I would say, asserts their status as objects in themselves. The display podiums were quite didactic, so an attempt to further multiply the instantiations or valiances of the objects through mirror reflection and the section cut. And the profile that each set of objects produce as it was sliced by the podium establishes a relationship between part to whole, where sometimes the segregated interior volumes are further separated by the cut and sometimes the way in which apparently separate objects produce one continuous interior. Materially, the project produces strong contrast between inside and out, so muted colors on the outside, deep hues on the inside, even velvety exterior surfaces, craggy, crusted interiors. And maybe another contrast would be the kind of smooth elegance of the surface finish and the clumsy agglomerations where the parts clump and pile but don't cohere into any discernible whole.
Uh, and I would say um, the work was really conceived in the round. Um, so the point was, or the ambition was to deny any kind of frontality and ask uh, that the things be viewed in motion. And the multi-sidedness multi prioritizes this kind of uh, perambulatory viewing, which elongates a time span of engagement uh, and hopefully replaces a, an instantaneous comprehension with the kind of curious pleasure of the unexpected. So uh, the encounter was intended to be fluid um, and not fixed or stable. So that elasticity would produce a new architectural subjectivity defined by a reciprocity between the thing and its viewer. There were also four drawings that accompanied the models, uh, one for each of these formal families, which were conceived as a set of studies where gradients and deep shadow worked to produce three-dimensionality in the objects themselves and in the drawing, where they seem to be almost kind of catapulting through space. But on the other hand, the sticker-like quality of the figures against their gradient backgrounds works to flatten the image, reasserting the two-dimensionality of the picture plane. Um, so it was really a joy to work with Sire to make the exhibition happen. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful to Hernan for the opportunity. Um, and so I want to shift now to some recent work that's been coming out of the practice in the past uh, number of months. and. Um, Maybe an acknowledgement before I dive in that many of the projects, uh, this next set of projects were done in collaboration with Adam Fieri, uh, and some of them are still works in progress, as I mentioned above. Uh, this is not them, this is other work. But uh, so there's this interest in objects generally, I think continues, but recently the, the objects that we've been working with uh, have a different origin. So if before they were obsessively sculpted forms that developed from a highly iterative process, now the objects are lifted from the world around us. And the newer work is engaged with concepts of the post-digital. So trying to understand what role architecture can play in critically examining the ubiquity of the digital in our world and explorations of what post-digital form and modes of representation might be. So what do I mean by post-digital? The term is used more commonly in art theory and cultural studies, but I think is increasingly being taken up in architecture. And we are undoubtedly in a time after the digital revolution or digital turn, maybe in scare quotes, where digitality or digitalness or the digital is ubiquitous and the line between physical and digital is imperceptible. In terms of digital imagery, capabilities and tools, what was once rare and novel is now uh, very familiar and uh, ubiquitous. So some characteristics of the post-digital which are important to our work include not regarding the digital as a kind of agent of revolutionary change or technological positivism, but something more subtle which operates through modes that are newly invisible or difficult to detect. We're attempting to understand sensibilities that emerge from computation as the background condition of our reality. And instead of assuming this forward vector of progress, we're taking an omnidirectional purview. So kind of looking around, trying to understand what's happening, uh, looking backwards, forwards to, to both sides. So I think it's clear uh, that collectively we're in a place where every aspect of our daily lives is guided by computational processes and actually is, I think for the most part, lubricated by it. <coughs> and architecturally speaking then, the, the post-digital calls for a critical consideration of these processes which we take for granted. Uh, in our recent work, this has meant a focus on blurring digital and physical materiality, revealing grains of computation, whether through surface articulation, render settings, uh, and the manipulation of digitally native effects, and developing an approach to post-digital aggregation or composition. And in terms of techniques, we've been using photogrammetry quite a bit. So for those not familiar with this, um, it means a series of photographs which construct a digital model that has two main components, uh, a polygon mesh and a texture map or image. So you can kind of see Di diagrammatically what that's like here. I think photogrammetry appeals to us because uh, maybe one, it suggests new forms of creativity and authorship where the photo scanning of a found object is a creative act. And so similar to other types of post-internet or post-digital art, sampling, copying, collaging, and representation or representation considered to be new forms of authorship. Second, uh, photogrammetry produces expanded notions of materiality where physical materials take on the plasticity of digital material and the photo scan can produce uncanny, near realistic depictions of everyday objects. Photogrammetry severs form from materiality, so uh, produces these two sets of new kind of raw material to work with, the form in a mesh model uh, and the material image uh, in a texture map. So what was once integrated here, let's say, in the mineral structure of a rock, uh, now cleaves, cleaves apart into two things. 
Um, so I'm just going to show a series of kind of small scale projects that we've been working on in the past few months. Um, for this one, we start with the texture map of a rock derived from a photogrammetry scan. So isolating the image from the 3D form, we develop new compositions from those image fragments. So we're not trying to recreate or reassemble the rock as it originally was, but looking for new relationships that can be created through these patches. And the new image rock retains much of the textural and color characteristics of the original, but also points towards new compositions and figures. So we then try to move uh, to produce mass and volume from those two-dimensional studies and take advantage of the way in which photogrammetry, as I mentioned, kind of pulls apart the materiality uh, and the form. So uh, those things can begin to misalign, uh, the materiality can, can become graphic, et cetera. And start, then we start kind of working in um, regular geometries to the aggregations, sometimes adopting, adopting the material textures of the photogrammetry rock. So that material can now wrap a, wrap a cylinder or wrap an arch, um, or sometimes reflecting quite literally uh, their platonic form, which you see happening there in the sphere. And eventually then, kind of taking on more complex architectural concerns of interior volume, massing, entry, ground, and so forth. Uh, so here in this project, we were working um, on questions of aggregation, digital physical composites, and material indifference in a proposal for a tower. And what was interesting, uh, I think, here for us was that the that intricate, complex digital models of the type we used to spend weeks developing become like found objects through this photogrammetry process. So in a sense, we get it for free. And so we turn our attention away from the production of those complex forms and towards their aggregation, their materiality, the way in which they interact with more regular geometric elements and so forth. So in the tower, the rocks appear sometimes as rocks, but also as thickened surface patches and images projected onto other forms. The overall organization of the building is an L, which wraps the site, and the rock objects kind of accumulate on the inside corner <clears throat> and hold public program like auditorium, cafe, gallery space, and so forth. And the more cellular private program elements hug the outer edge of the site. I think similar to inside things, the gallery installation here, objects agglomerate in a casual, almost awkward manner to produce interior volume or a courtyard. And the parts are of such a scale that they maintain a kind of dominance over any clear whole. For the next set of images, we were interested in the uncanny near realism that the renderings of photogrammetry models produce and the way that we could author those qualities. So for us, um, it wasn't enough to just represent the material with uh, irony, let's say, or disaffection, which is largely the case with a lot of post-internet art, but our ambition was to produce new qualities and sensibilities through these post-digital manipulations. So, um, and these are, these are images which were produced for a forthcoming publication where we're kind of trying to write about the post-digital aesthetics and the role of uh, the ideas, kind of post-digital post concepts, let's say, in architecture, and are studying manipulations of photogrammetry through uh, altered mesh resolutions and texture map alterations. So um, in particular here, I think the gradient patches are of interest. So um, I think the gradient works for us in a couple of different ways. So uh, sometimes the gradients are always applied to the texture map image in Photoshop. So um, the, the, sometimes they jump from two-dimensional to three-dimensional expressions, let's say. So on the left there, that little uh, kind of oval shape, which is uh, over that lump, something which is like flat in the texture map, and then as you render it out, becomes uh, three-dimensional, or the yellow and orange um, gradient in the corner has this irregular edge because this is the result of the way in which the texture map divides up the image and has no relationship to the geometry uh, on which it's sitting. And then the reflectivity of the sphere, uh, I think, emphasizes for us, it's almost a kind of third eye in the way that it produces another view of the scene and reinforces the artificiality of the scene as it reveals the black digital abyss beyond. This project uh, is the first one where we've taken some of these post-digital images and are producing a physical object out of them. So the constructed object is hopefully en route to Austin, Texas today <laughs> to be shown in this exhibition that accompanies a Secret Life of Buildings symposium next month. So here we're taking a rendered two-dimensional image of a digital model and using that to produce a new three-dimensional physical rock. 
And the new rock is made of a series of planes, horizontal and horizontal sections, which kind of turn up the wall vertically and re-instantiate the, or instantiate the digital model. So to do that, the rendered image is sliced into rows of pixels and stretched or smeared across each layer to produce another more optically blurry version of the rock surface, now reduced to swatches and stripes of color. Uh, so the treatment of the image has two effects. Overall, the object appears to be a 3D translation of the image, but from certain angles, the optical effects of the layers interfere with that. And the qualities of the image, such as hue and saturation, are retained in the graphic pixel stripes, but their representational status as parts of the image of a rock is disrupted. And the title of the project, Another Rock, just refers to the way in which the digital rock and the physically constructed rock aren't kind of representations of some real rock, but are just another rock. Um, and maybe to close, I wanted to show uh, briefly the project that uh, was done with TEAM, which is the collaboration between myself, Tom Moran, Meredith Miller, and Adam Fury for the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Biennale this past summer. Uh, so this project was done for the exhibition curated by Monica Ponce de Leon and Cynthia Davidson, The Architectural Imagination. Um, I don't really have time to go through all of the nitty-gritty details of the project, but I thought I would give kind of a quick tour and highlight some of the ways in which um, this project overlaps with some of the topics I've been talking about this evening. So the project only had a few givens, uh, a site, a set of deliverable, deliverables, and a prompt. So the site that we were given was the Packard plant. The set of deliverables were drawings and one large scale model, which had to be 48, uh, four feet by seven feet in plan. And the prompt was the title of the exhibition, The Architectural Imagination. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Packard plant is this abandoned automobile factory in Detroit, maybe one of the most iconic images used to represent Detroit's decline and um, a kind of famous example of quote unquote ruin porn. And visiting the site, we were initially struck by two things, uh, its material reality and its image. So although no longer used as a factory and in disrepair, the site wasn't empty. In fact, it was teeming with stuff. And we felt a commitment to dealing with that as a material reality, not assuming that it should be or even could be raised. Uh, and obviously the image is overwhelming and iconic and largely constituted by this materiality. Uh, our first impulse as designers was to think about how this vast heap of materials, which is assumed to have no value, and in fact quite the opposite is considered a liability, could be used. How could we flip the perception of this material reality from something useless to something useful? So our first attempts were to do exactly that, to use the materials from the site to produce something new. And we immediately started testing this idea. So crushing up bricks, concrete, and other materials, combining that with granulated plastic, uh, which was taken from post-consumer waste streams as the binding agent, and casting that material into new forms. And I think, um, we worked very hard then to develop a kind of expertise in this method. So what were, the what were the kind of specific qualities of these objects? How could we work with the distribution of aggregate, uh, color, artificial and synthetic color? How could we control surface texture and arrange from rough to smooth? And kind of working in that way allowed us to figure out what things we could control and what things we could not control or did not choose to control in the process. So I think the bigger implication was that once we began to use building debris and rubble as building material, the image of that material is changed. The approach moves the perception from scarcity to abundance. So questions about what the site is lacking become questions about what the site possesses. So these are drawings from the exhibition that show some of the materials in the project, some from the Packard site and some from regional waste streams. And we quite literally changed the image of the material uh, through photogrammetry scans. Uh, and if you see the actual prints, they're printed on a kind of glittery reflective vinyl and obviously working with uh, kind of artificial color backgrounds. And we presented these as material portraits. Um, so we then moved into like a kind of longer phase of uh, site research and learning about the history of the site and the history of Albert Kahn and Associates who are the architects of the original plant. And, um, maybe in the interest of time, I'm just gonna basically give you the takeaways. So uh, the takeaways from that were that even though the original site looks really homogenous, it's actually incredibly differentiated. And it had a really rich history, not only of um, 
development and export of the automobile, but actually also of architecture and construction technology. So uh, Albert Kahn and his brother Julius developed a whole set of patents for um, construction technology systems from the work they did here at the Packard plant. So given this newfound understanding of the variable structural integrity, we developed a strategy where we would selectively demolish portions of the site and combined pieces of the existing buildings with our new kind of cast aggregate forms. Programmatically, the project is a plant. So you can see here, the, it's a very large site. It's broken into, it's nearly 100 acres. It's broken into a series of urban scale zones marked by large open spaces. Um, so on the right is the area where materials would be received from these post-consumer waste streams. And on the left part of this image is the sorting and processing for those materials. You see here uh, some kind of demonstrations uh, on site of, research, of, of kind of construction technology demonstrations. Uh, there's also a place here for public entrance and gallery and where you would start your tour if you were coming for a tour. Uh, on the left, you see a um, kind of showroom where you could shop for and uh, take away in a pickup truck your very own one room shed made out of this aggregate material. And then there's a kind of office park research and development facility for material technology uh, and some more uh, public open space on this side of the site. So there were four kind of building types that were developed, uh, which each had a different approach to the existing structure and a different way of using the aggregate, aggregate material. So uh, this, which we called a kind of mega masonry mountain, were large um, masonry blocks, basically, which are craned into place around uh, existing columns, producing kind of hypostyle interiors. Uh, this is a thin um, cast in place shell with drapes over a chunk of existing floor slabs, columns, and beams. These are a set of kind of room size um, objects which sit within the existing wire frame, we were calling it kind of slabs, beams, and columns. And then these are the freestanding conical sheds that I mentioned a second ago. Um, and so some images of the model itself uh, here. So I think uh, we were really interested in the material reality of the site translating into the approach that we took to representation. Um, so we, attained, we attempted to, main, to maintain a kind of verisimilitude where we weren't working through abstraction into lines or hatches trying to represent materials that way, but we're actually trying as best we could to use the actual materials to, rep to be the materials of the site. So uh, that, that, that's true for both the material tests um, and the way in which we approach the physical model. And in the drawings, we were interested in kind of blurring the digital and physical in those. So we would make a lot of physical studies, uh, photo scan them, and then use those to produce the images of the project. This is the hypostyle hall that I was mentioning. Uh, and this is the uh, project in the pavilion. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna do this third act. Can you unshutter mine? Thanks. Um, what we, what we sort of decided to do after presenting our work individually was to um, choose a series of terms. We, choose, we chose five terms. Um, and uh, these terms we, we did not discuss. We selected them because they seemed like they might, they made sense for our work. Um, but um, we didn't really want to get into what they meant individually sort of as a way of trying to keep things a bit lively um, here. And um, as, a, as a game, I guess that's kind of warming up now, sort of a game, we um, uh, have selected a series of images that go along with the term. Um, so the, the terms that we selected were image, materiality, figures, color, and representation. So um, I think what we're going to start by doing is um, uh, if my, if my projection is working, um, start scrolling through, at least to start, um, the first image that we selected um, uh, on the topic of image. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? Yeah. But I'm waiting for your I know. projector to come up. It's kind of, 
And then sleeping. we're going to do like a rock, paper, scissors. We're just like, <laughs> we haven't shared the images. So I, I, I think that this, this, this is not really about, um, it's really not about sort of dictionary definitions, although I kind of go there sometimes, but um, uh, really how these terms become instrumentalized in our work. Um, okay. Well, I don't know. You're not there yet. I'm not there yet. I am oh. there. Oh, it's a black or black. It's a different black. Wow. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Go. Okay. So image. Okay. So, so, um, so what I'm showing here is an image of, uh, by an artist named Artie Vierkant. Uh, this is an installation view of a gallery show that he had in New York called Image Objects. Um, and so Artie Vierkant says uh, that, quote, everything is anything else. And what he means by that is that there's no original and no copy anymore um, in the kind of post-internet age. There are only instantiations. And so in architecture then, the building, the drawing, the photograph, the rendering would all be the same in terms of being the site of the real project. And I think that this gives images in particular tremendous agency because they're the things which travel fastest and widest. And I think certainly images have always been important to architecture and architectural dissemination, but I think the status of images has changed such that, the, that there's a kind of flattening of the value between the image and maybe the thing that the image is of. The flattening of the value. Yeah. They are equally valuable now. Yeah, I totally The image agree. is no longer less valuable than the original. So, okay, so here, my image image. Uh, my image image is a, kind of a throwback image. Um, this is Adrian Piper, who's a um, conceptual artist. Um, uh, a drawing she did called Self-Portrait Exaggerating My Negroid, My Negroid Features. And this is um, from 1981. She, she mostly did um, installation work uh, and some performance work. She didn't do that many drawings. Um, so uh, the image, um, and I sort of think about in kind of three ways. Um, the first is um, sort of an artificial imitation of a thing. Um, so it could be a sculpture or a drawing or a photograph. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be flat. Um, although I think the question of flatness is something that comes up a lot in the in thinking about an image. Um, so, but in that sort of this idea that the image produces the image of something, right? A sculpture could be the image of some of of of, of a man, um, but producing some distance from the real, I think, is super important, um, and that, that it implies sort of process of translation. Um, and the other way to think of, that I like to think about the image is um, as, as a sort of mental representation, right? I had this image of this person in my mind, right? Um, uh, so in that way, it becomes a sort of an idea. So it's it's it also could not be it doesn't need to be material. It could be it could be an, it could be really um, a way of talking about um, something that is removed from the real and becomes a sort of idea of something. Um, and then there's sort of the, more of the optical translation, so a reflection, um, which does assume a sort of flattening. Um, so in this, this drawing, um, Adrienne Piper, she's an um, African-American woman who with really fine features and um, very light skin. And so she, she draws this picture of herself, um, and exaggerating her nose becomes uh, wider, her lips become fuller, her hair becomes thicker. Um, and, and that way, she's kind of projecting sort of an artificial construction of her own identity. Um, so in that sense, a sort of um, uh, self-produced, self sort of distanced from, from, from the real. Um, so in, in my work, the concept of the image allows us to, um, that's it's interested in sort of that space of translation. Um, so I like to think of the image also as a sort of literally a technique of flattening. So I, 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 I think that I tend to um, think about how to move from um, a, a drawing to a model, a model to a drawing, and what that means um, in terms of sort of literal, literally te techniques of, of, of freezing something and translating it into something that maybe we could be thought of as more of an, of an image. Um, so in the case of say the, the fireplace project or the Eve detail project, in, those, in both of those cases, um, I was looking at details and um, taking them out of, the con out of their context of, uh, let's say, a drawing set, and just seeing them just simply as, a, as lines on a page, and that way um, 
uh, and, and by seeing them as sort of a fixed, a fixed thing without its references, um, you kind of, I was able to create space for the production of, 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 of something new. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of wondering, um, so you mentioned that sculpture could be an image. Yeah. Do you see a distinction between a sculpture and a photograph of a sculpture? Yeah. <laughs> I think they all could be images. But they're both they're images. images. And I, I agree about the flattening. I think that that's really important. Um, um, I, I don't think that there, that's um, uh, necessarily, but I don't necessarily, I don't know that, it, that, it's, that it's a new instantiation, like if it requires the sort of the digital age or the post-digital age to, to think about it in that sense. I mean, I guess uh, I was It speaking... always assumes that you can always, that it's kind of a leap um, into the world of an idea. I guess I was referring specifically to a kind of digital image because I'm interested in the speed of transmission, so yeah. it wouldn't... The kind of conceptual idea of the sculpture as image would be a different definition of image, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking he specifically here, I guess, about this idea of the digital image and the way in which, um, because you can't control the digital image in terms of like authorship or authenticity or originality or copy, that there's a kind of uh, it just it, it produces a disruption, I think, in this kind of flow of like authorship and creative production that you're referring to, where. Um, I think the conception of image that you're speaking of is a much more personal one, I guess, than a uh, um, yeah, I mean, collective I, one. I, I guess, I, guess um, I don't know about personal. I think that it's, that it's um, yeah. Um, I think the, 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 the question of, of, of flatness and the question of sort of the idea of like, as you were describing in your talk, it's the, the omni, omni view, mm -hmm. right? And looking at things, um, um, forwards and backwards and, and laterally, um, and as it relates to, let's say, the production of an image, I, I, I would tend to agree with. I think that this idea that there's an idea of, um, I think that, that I assume this is sort of an idea of a real and then a distance from a real mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is m m maybe kind of a more of a retro way of thinking about uh, you know, kind of a more linear, kind of or, mm. uh, linear way of thinking about, about the production of image, which yeah, I don't know that I uh, would go, go to my grave trying to defend. <laughs> you would or would not go would to your not. grave? <laughs> but no, I mean, I think there's, that distance exists. I guess it's just whether, the, whether one takes precedent over the other. Yeah. Like, does one originate before the other? Um, and I think, like, one of the common threads or one of the things that you laid on the table at the very beginning was this idea of the primitive mm -hmm. and the origin point. And I think, obviously, that's something that... Uh, oh, sorry. I feel weird because I'm not sure if I should be, like, here or here. talking to Mira. But... Um, <laughs> The origin point is clearly something that I think I'm also thinking about in terms of what the origins of form making are and uh, where do we derive form from um, and whether there's, uh, so I think here again with the image, this idea of the kind of original or the real is on the table. I was surprised to see your work and that, that you started to work with found things. Um, that surprised me. <laughs> um, um, I think I think it's exciting. Yeah. Uh, do, do you? Should do, do you? Should we, should we do the next one? Yeah. Okay. So Ready? this is materiality. Huh. Okay. Am I? Do you want me to talk first? Sure. Okay. Um, so materiality. I mean, I think uh, I'll repeat myself to a certain extent because I think a lot of these ideas I covered in the kind of talk, but. Um, I'm interested in this idea of a kind of post-digital notion of materiality where the digital and the physical uh, are the same or meld or kind of fluidly move between mm -hmm. back and forth and um, m in multiple directions. So um, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is that I'm uh, still really interested, as I have been in my work for a long time, in um, a kind of material specificity where uh, material, there isn't a kind of essential or universal notion of materiality, but things are kind of taken for what they are and um, those particular kind of qualities or um, characteristics or sensibilities uh, are the thing that I work with. And gain expertise on, right? You use the word expertise. Sure, yeah, right. which is a kind of, uh, maybe in my DNA from my education, but this idea of kind of like working iteratively and honing, yeah. honing yeah. the, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I think that there's, there's a, definitely a similarity in the way we think about materiality. I mean, I, this is, a, for those of you guys who don't know this, what this is, this is a catalog of, of, of Maxwell rendering um, material, material library. 
Um, uh, these are image maps that go onto surfaces in, in a digital environment. And um, I put this up here there not really to be uh, like contrary, like that there exists no, there's no such thing as material, uh, material is only image, let's say. Um, but that, um, but that that has a deep effect, but, but, but the way in which we work and the way that I work and um, uh, it has, let's say the way that, the, the way that we work, um, uh, produce work affects the way we read work. Right, so for those who have heard me speak about projects that I've, I've worked on at building projects, I tend to look at, um, at uh, uh, building in the same way, that building, um, that building materials are not, um, building materials are all about cladding. <laughs> The lean materials are all about sort of veneers of materials that go on top of other things. Um, that it's there, there's very little sort of interest in total authenticity. Like it's I'm, I, let's say not um, that things are not. Um, it's, it's disinterested. I'm disinterested in in this idea of sort of an authentic sense of material. Like so, a stone building is 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 a building made of lots of things with a very very thin coat of um, uh, stone on on the exterior, right? So um, in that way, it's uh, the 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 kind of the parts and the, the finishes um, are become like images um, uh, in the same way that I say texture map is um, an image in a in a rendered environment. So I think that there's a sort of similar um, sort of sensibility. I, I'm interested though in, in how you then deal with physical models and and how you think about um, sort of the construction of, of things with thickness. Um, there's a there's a there's a beauty and 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 a sort of nostalgia I think in in like things that are thick and things that are monolithic, um, um, and at the same time you're also thinking about um, uh, the sort of the sort of coding or image that's projected onto something, um, and I'm, I'm curious how thick that is. You know what I mean? Um, I mean yeah. a physical model it, that could tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. If you imagine it, you said questions of scale. What happens at different scales? Um, yeah. I think it changes project to project. So I think for a project like Inside Things, I am interested in the kind of surface textures uh, and that the, let's say, like materiality, conceptually the materiality is quite thin. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not it's literally thin, but like I don't want mm. you to know how it's made. So um, it should be, it should not be apparent. I think in a project like the Detroit Reassembly Plant um, with Team, obviously, uh, the materiality is one of the major, say, thematics or theses of the project. Right. And so um, as much as possible, it is a kind of faithful rendition of brick, of concrete, uh, of sand, of melted plastic, and the materials which actually are being proposed in the project. Um, and so when possible, like that uh, plastic shell, um, the proposed, this kind of speculative proposal is that that would be cast in place and the uh, shell that's in the physical model was a thermocast shell made out of those materials. Mm -hmm. So it's not always possible, but I think we kind of tried mm -hmm. the best we could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but not in, not in any kind of attempt to be authentic, but actually uh, in an attempt to be earnest, I guess, about what it was we were proposing. And so I mean, as I mentioned- It always gets ground down. You know, it's not like you have a, a brick Right? No, just, you know, it like, always gets, so it gets ground down. It gets, it gets ground and reconstituted. Sort of, I mean, yeah. I think it has to as a kind of, I mean, it's almost a violent act, but it kind of has to in order to re, can reproduce the image of the site. Like, so we're trying to overcome this incredibly right. iconic image, and the way to do that is to just grind it up yeah. and make it new yeah. again. So, um, okay, let's go to the next okay. one. So, uh, figures. Why don't you go first this time? Okay. Um, okay, so um, Deanna Lawson is a contemporary photographer. I chose two of her photographs. Um, the left one is um, Dawn 2012. 2012. Um, the other second one, the one on the right, is um, Girls with Oil Faces 20, um, 2004. So, um, I'd say that there's two ways that the concept of the figure has, has instrumentalized in my work. Um, the first is how the figure relates to its background and the sort of a figure ground relationship, and the second is um, this idea of posture. Um, uh, in this, in her photographs, um, which I think are staggering, um, 
Uh, they're, they're always kind of nearly symmetrical in frontal compositions, um, and there's usually a body, uh, either a single or a pair of bodies, usually brown bodies. Um, they're kind of, there's a semi-harsh lighting, and usually they're set in interior domestic settings. And I, one of the things I think is striking about her photographs pretty consistently is that there's this relationship between the skin or the hair or the clothing of the figures in front to its background. So sometimes there's a sort of pot thing, things pop, the figure pops out. Um, sometimes the figures sink in to the background, but there's always a sort of dialogue. So like the image on the left, the skin sort of starts to have a relationship to the, the wood panel door in the, in the closet, and her sort of platinum blonde hair has just a, is kind of white like the wall. Uh, um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of, the, the figure kind of gets pulled away from the back from, from its from its context. At the same time, there's kind of a also a, um, a a kind of a gravitational force bringing her back into the image through a sort of color associations, um, and um, certainly in the case of the image on the right, where the 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 two girls sort of sink in, there's kind of a relationship of the pattern of the dresses to the pattern of the couches, and um, it, it's it's similar to the way that I read the interiors of the galleries in that Numa where um, I kind of ask the question, which precedes which? Does the background um, anticipate the inhabitants or does the inhabitants kind of produce, produce the background? Which is kind of a nonsensical question in a way, but it's something that I think about a lot um, architecturally um, when uh, um, in a series of projects that I've worked on where looking at how there's a sort of flickering between um, uh, where, um, uh, let's say the object is either recedes or um, starts to emerge from, from its background or its context. Um, and then the question of posture with figure um, uh, is, is also something that I think a lot about in terms of how, um, how, how, uh, how sort of something could kind of seem lumbering or seem um, nestled or seem at any number of things that, that starts to emerge from um, the form, of, a f form of, a, of an object which starts to take on figural qualities. Um, and, but those always tend to also have a relationship to and question its relationship to the background, either through color or through kind of a use of pattern. Um, so these are um, works by an artist named Rachel DeHood. Uh, and it's a, <clears throat> well, you can, you can see what they are. They're a series of kind of a mixture of 2D and 3D elements. So I'm interested here in the um, kind of the ambiguous figure and the awkward fit between these figures and the two-dimensional profile, which I think would be one type of figure mixed with images of 3D figures mixed with actual 3D objects. So uh, on the two-dimensional uh, plate, let's say, there's a printed image of a three-dimensional thing, which when seen in elevation obscures the fact that it's two-dimensional uh, and has a very different relationship with the three-dimensional component of the piece mm -hmm. than when seen obviously on the oblique. So, uh, and I'm interested uh, in kind of discrete numbers of figures, let's say, that produce intra-connections or relationships between them, um, but not necessarily a discernible whole. So uh, I think, um, that was, you can see that in the Inside Things exhibition and you can see that in some of the other later projects that I showed, like the Tower of Rocks. Um, so maybe, but I definitely, I didn't, it's not here, and, uh, but I definitely also have done work where the issue of posture is important in the way, and uh, in the, uh, I guess kind of when I was saying what I was calling like elusive form, like so in the way that something can kind of allude to a familiar thing without actually being that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think your figures are more, I guess maybe I was working with figuration, which was cheating, than figures. Than, than literal <laughs> figures. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean. Okay. <laughs> yeah, keep going, okay. <laughs> Do it. Um, color. Shall we? Sure. Okay. Um, so for color, um, this is, uh, I have two images. I have this guy and I have this guy. Um, uh, this image is uh, William Pope L., um, who is a contemporary artist, 
Um, he's been working since late 70s, early 80s, and does a lot of performance work. He does a lot of kind of famous for his what his crawl performance crawls, but he does um, has done a long, ongoing series of drawings um, where he writes um, kind of paints writes a series of descriptions about color. They always begin like black people are dot 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 purple people are green people are. Um, I think an example of here, uh, here. I think he has like hundreds of these of these drawings. Um, red people are red people are boner cosmic. Black people are for rent. People purple people don't believe. So there's 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 a a, a sort of um, uh, um, absurdity, an absurdist or absurdist approach to color, which touch on things that have um, I think a politic associated with them uh, and, and and resonate. Um, and in ways that can be very striking, and at other times they're just just kind of just nutty. And I, I, I that's the way I think about color in a way. Um, so uh, uh, I take a sort of pluralistic sort of stance where colors are I, I are packed with meaning and connotations. Um, I, I I I really dislike. Um, talk of color that is an all only about a sort of a formal a formal idea that does that kind of refuses to think about it in terms of its connotations and its histories um, uh, and its politics um, um, and also um, but at the same time those effects and those histories um, can also be undermined and and be pretty absurd and 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 subjective so um, uh, I think pattern also works the same way. Uh, and then the second image, which thank you to my students who posed for this. This is this was just a, a something where I had a strike off of the wallpaper that I used for this show, and um, it's the same strike off, same drawing, same 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 piece of wallpaper on the wall. I had different students stand in front of it. I was, it tickled me to no end because I was witnessing this throughout the production of the project. That the color that I selected, it was a sort of brown rose and it took on through the production of through its its reproduction um, in rendering formats over and over again because we we did what we call once twice three times four times baked res, uh, uh, renderings um, uh, we uh, it started to take on a fleshy tone but the, the but the quality of the color of the flesh it c totally varied um, um, depending on kind of who was standing in front of it. So these are just with my iPhone. I took photos, and the iPhone sort of does this weird thing where um, it's just like exact same lighting conditions, and they were done within like minutes, a minute of each other, these photographs. The iPhone was um, kind of collapsing the color of the background to the color of the, of the person in front of them. So um, they're a sort of likeness. I'm not assuming a one-to-one -one likeness, but a sort of shift in the way that the color was perceived started to take place just through the production of the sort of digital production. Um, uh, so it's, it's really interested in, in the way that um, the way that um, kind of flesh can be sort of start, start to be intimated. And I mean, in that way, um, kind of an idea about the figure kind of also emerged in the production of the of the rendering, even though um, it's just of drapery itself, just through kind of its associations with color um, from my perspective. What inspired you to put those images next to each other? Like, did you know that the color was going to be different until you put it them side well, by side? Well, I was noticing it. It was happening in real time. I was noticing it not on my phone, but when I was take when I was when we were working on it. Every time, you know, every time a student would be working on the project, we'd be hanging these things up, and every time, we'd be like, that's so weird. It looks just like the same tone as the student, but the students were all different colors, you know. And so it's like, I need to take a picture of this. <laughs> and it just happened that that the iPhone was doing this. I actually started taking pictures with like a good camera and it was it wasn't producing the same effect hmm. it was like getting making more contrast and I was like oh, let's, let's just <laughs> this looks better yeah right. no, exactly um, so here I kind of am particularly interested in the color gradient which uh, I think is no surprise a kind of ubiquitous and like easy thing which we produce uh, in excess these days, and I think as a digital, digitally native technique, it's a good example of something who, that's value has kind of changed over time. So um, on the left is a Gerhard Richter piece called 921 Strip uh, from 2011, so it's not that old, but in a way he's here as the kind of representative of uh, older, uh, say, approaches to uh, creative production. In the middle is a piece by Corey Archangel, uh, Called, I'm not going to read the whole title because it's very long, but it's from a series of gradients that he does. And, uh, and then on the right, of course, an image uh, by myself and Adam Fury. So um, I think 
for um, the Gerhard Richter is interesting because it's produced digitally, but it's produced through this incredibly laborious kind of painstaking process, pixel by pixel, uh, at least to get the kind of color array, which is then digitally digitally kind of smeared or stretched across the image. The Cory Archangel is, uh, you know, ironic, um, where his whole point is that, you know, you basically the instructions to produce the thing are in the title of the thing itself, and then you make a big print and you put it in a gallery and it has all of this value. So uh, there's a kind of commentary that he's producing, and I think that the approach that we're taking to the color gradient is different. So uh, not an ironic one, but actually a kind of earnest and maybe sometimes almost didactic one where the color gradient kind of reveals these uh, kind of background, background processes and grains of computation in the work. Um, so I'm interested, I think, in this image that Mira is showing, particularly because I think it does the same thing, which is reveal this background process mm -hmm. that's happening in your iPhone uh, that is actually impacting the kind of aesthetic output of your project uh, out of your control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay. Do you, should, we, should we open up to any questions before? Yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of okay. like late. And yeah. yeah, thank you guys for being here. Um, uh, if there's any questions, we do have one other slide we can go through, but um, what's the last slide? All right, okay, so representation. representation. This is the one I have two for. So this is one where um, maybe just quickly the, the kind of material test cone is on the left and you see the drawing on the right uh, that is the photogrammetry scan of that cone and then put into the, into the drawing. And this is a series of works by an artist um, named Clement Baia, who's surface proxy, where he also scans artifacts, uh, classical artifacts from museums, produces their image on fabric, and then rewraps CNC milled reproductions of those objects with their own image and produces this like really what I think is amazing relationship between the image and the object. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that the qu question of re representation loops back to the question of, in, of, of image, um, certainly in mine as well. This is just a photograph of a, of, of an insurance document that I had on my desk that made me laugh um, that just says, you know, the bl this page left blank, in this page left blank intentionally. Um, so, so it's in, in its representation of, uh, it's represent, representing a black, a blank page. Um, of course, in its production, the quality of thing, of the thing, so its blankness um, is, is undermined. Um, so. <laughs> Great, yeah, so we're happy to have, take questions if there are any. Or not. Or we could just go to the reception. Yeah. <laughs> Going once. Um, for both of you, there seems to be a, a very deliberate tension that you set up between illusionistic versus abstract art. And uh, what is the function of that tension? Yeah. What's the What's the agenda? In, of in that our tension? own work or in the example? Why not that choose mentioned? one or the other? Why, why set up the tension? I mean, I, I think for me, um, it's, that tension is very important. And, um, and part of it is um, because I want um, work to, the work to exist, um, carve out a territory that's lateral. Um, where where it, it's some the the work has um, has multiple ways of engagement and um, can um, uh, kind of make make one pause. So I, I think that it has to do with um, uh, a, a, a sort of question of how how one. Although I think that my work is rather opaque, how one could start to engage and um, and sort of trying to set up what I like to call like sort of a territory that between the literal and the, and, and the ideal or between the literality and ideality. So something can exist in, the, in, in, in kind of within a materially specific way, but also in the space of, of, of ideas. Um, so it, it, for me, that there, there's, a, there's a very um, uh, concerted effort to produce that sort of tension. I feel like I have a very similar answer. I would maybe frame it. Um also in terms of abstraction, an approach to abstraction where um, like uh, instead of producing the kind of universal ideal of something, uh, abstraction is used to push things towards, the, towards some known or familiar entity, which would be maybe towards the illusionistic, uh, but not quite get there. And I think that that 
um, refusal to actually land there is also in an interest, uh, similar interest, I think, that you're, you're describing uh, of engagement and a kind of desire to um, produce mm, like a multivalence or uh, the opportunity for like multiple associations with mm -hmm. the work to exist mm -hmm. instead of kind of either closing it down or uh, estranging its audience or its user or its participant or. Hello. Um, you both use the word drawing to refer to pieces that you made, uh, and the neither looked like drawings in the way I think about drawing. So I wanted to know what, how you define drawing and what, how do you see it as a drawing? Why you use that term for the, the mm -hmm. two works or pieces? Um, maybe I'll speak about that specifically through the um, Detroit Reassembly Plant Project, because I think um, in that instance, uh, the drawing for us, it was important that the drawing be a kind of measured architectural drawing. So uh, it's, it's a very specific projection uh, and uh, is a measured drawing. Um, but, uh, but we weren't interested in um, some of the typical abstractions of drawing, like uh, reducing material textures to a hatch or these kinds of notational systems. So we tried to uh, produce the section drawing but using um, photogrammetry and these other means of try a kind of ver verisimilitude to the material life of the project. Um, but I think because it is uh, measured and done through a um, projection, uh, for us it still was very much a drawing of the project uh, as opposed to like a perspective image, you know. Yeah, I, I think that there's, um, I, I tend to uh, discriminate generally um, that the measured drawing or the architectural drawing is the drawing. Uh, there's our images, models, but I, I do sometimes find myself um, in, the, in the interest of producing flatness for everything. So I think at one point the uh, models can be drawings. Everything could be a drawing also at the same time um, in the same way that you could look at you know, many things as models. Um, and, and I think it, it comes from a, a desire to um, uh, uh, um, set up set up more of an even playing field in the material production that what we're involved in constantly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys.